Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are talking about our chain, which is an ambitious blockchain project that seeks to solve the problems of scalability and smart contract safety. On this conversation, we have Greg Meredith, who is the president of the cooperative building this blockchain, and Nash Foster, who is the CEO of CEO at Pyrofix Corporation that is leading much of the development work. Nash and Greg, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yep, thank you. Yeah, so Greg, you've all, all, already been on the show and at that time you were working for this project called Cinereo and we talked about um, Rolang, the smart contract language you were developing. Tell us a bit about what has happened in the meantime for you personally and professionally. Well, I mean, one of the things that was was crystal clear um, uh, back in in at the end of 2015 and beginning of 2016 was that if we were going to create um, a blockchain that could scale to kind of be the combination of Visa and Facebook, <laughs> um, that the existing architectures were not going to not going to work. And so we conceived um, a version of our chain at that time, which was built on um, you know, a model of computation um, uh, that I had uh, discovered back in the early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and there was so much community support. There was this groundswell of community support um, that when Scenario decided that it wasn't uh, in their best interest to pursue that, um, uh, I said, well, you know, but we promised the community we're going to build it, so let's build it. And the community uh, gathered themselves around the project and um, it's just been remarkable. Everyone has has kind of pitched in and um, and created this well-funded and viable project, and we're and we're just moving at this unbelievable pace. Uh, um, we just dropped the SDK last week. Um, kudos to Nash and his team for that. It was just amazing. Um, the 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 work on consensus has has accelerated uh, uh, to this huge point where we're now able to take a variety of existing um, consensus algorithms and express them uh, in this Casper uh, correct by construction framework. Um, and, we'll, and we're already committing code against an implementation of that. Um, uh, the Rolang itself, uh, the SDK includes a, a version of the compiler. So people can start uh, testing that out uh, for themselves. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, uh, with respect to this community is, is uh, how we have addressed governance. Um, so the, the model that we've uh, uh, um, addressed here is the cooperative model. So our, uh, our corporate structure is basically completely cribbed from REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, uh, which is a very, very successful cooperative, uh, Washington State cooperative. So we're, we're modeled after REI. And um, I'm just delighted. In October, we held our first uh, annual membership meeting, and the membership expressed its will uh, and voted. At the time, we were about 300 members. Now we're over 600 members. Um, and uh, we're about to go into our first governance forum, in which the membership talks about what it means to scale, not only the, um, you know, in terms of throughput, but, but in terms of the size of the organization. What does it mean to be a scalable blockchain that is also the first and, to my mind, only publicly owned and publicly operated blockchain? So Nash, this is your first time on our show. Um, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to work with the Archain project. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I've spent about 25 years in the industry building large-scale systems and securing them. Uh, I spent a number of years working on the cyber liability team at, at Google, uh, where I met my co-founder of Pyrofx, Mike Stay, and we got involved in Archain because Mike and Greg have been uh, research partners on uh, category theory and some other mathematical stuff for a number of years. Uh, we we started Pyrofx in 2016 as a company that was dedicated to building. Uh, distributed systems tools to make it possible for large-scale distributed programming to become you know, convenient for the average programmer. Uh, that has uh, really blossomed with the coming of the blockchain and, and our ability to contribute to our chain. So 
having a lot of fun. Uh, you know, our focus is on execution. We're here to make sure that the code gets written and delivered and that it's correct every every week. So, uh, Greg, you mentioned that uh, our chain is a cooperative. That's uh, that's a really interesting, I guess, uh, structure to have for an open source project. Is is this? I, mean, I, I I haven't really heard of any other open source projects that organize as a cooperative. Can you explain why you chose this model? Um, yeah, uh, l largely because we were looking for something that was in alignment with the open source. Um, the, the principles and values in the open source community, which seem to me to be largely about uh, democratic processes. And the most democratic process that I can imagine was one member, one vote. <laughs> which, which is what's, you know, in our bylaws. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly think that, that over time, we're going to see an elaboration of our governance structure um, that, that makes it... Uh, um, more nuanced uh, or, or more sophisticated than um, than just the, the, the than our beginnings, but I wanted to have a good beginning. I wanted to have a good structure, especially as, as we as we scale out. It's it's going to require, um, I I think uh, a, a lot more sophistication in terms of governance. But this was a very good start. I mean, it certainly makes a lot of sense for an open source project. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe others will will follow you down that path. Uh, who knows? Well, well, actually, there are. Um, so so we we um, we have been working with a group called Resonate, um, which is based out of Berlin, and they're a blockchain based music sharing service, and they've also structured themselves. So as yeah, a cooperative. right. That's right. They're also a cooperative. Uh, so what? As a member. Uh, and, and as a voting member, what types of things do you get to vote on? What does the governance uh, sort of afford you as a member? So, 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 kind of the first and, and most important thing is that you can vote for the board members. Um, so, in that sense, it's kind of a representational democracy. Um, but at any point, the mem membership can call a special meeting and get uh, proposals in front of the board. Um, so they they craft and shape. Um, how the co-op operates. Uh, I, I'll give an example where um, recently we had um, we had a deal. Um, the co-op is, is is exceptionally well funded right now, and so we need to attract applications to build on top of the platform. Uh, and so we set up a, a venture fund to do that. And the membership uh, um, compl they crafted the basic shape of the the structure of that deal. Um, you know, we ha we had a shape. We put it for review to the membership. The membership came back with a bunch of feedback, and the board listened to all of that and said, "Oh wow, uh, we need a different structure." And came back with a structure that was in alignment with what the membership wanted. And then um, we uh, executed that deal, and then the membership came back and said, "Oh wait, no, you needed more milestones in uh, in terms of how the funds were delivered." And so we went back to the venture fund and said, um, the membership is unhappy with this structure. Can we start restructure the fund allocation in terms of milestones? And they said, whatever, whatever keeps the membership happy, we're absolutely happy to do that. And so, so we, we post facto corrected the deal um, with respect to the membership. So uh, the membership's goals and desires. So that's how this works. <laughs> this is, in my opinion, democracy in action. So let's let's explore what our chain really is. Now I've spent the past day like going through the our chain documentation, and I can see that it's it's a very ambitious system that that seeks to solve scalability and smart contract safety at the same time. But and this project has some underpinnings uh, in theoretical mathematics. And the kind of con components you have ended up building uh, to realize this system are are very unique, right? So we'll seek to cover all of it, but perhaps just to start, explain to us your big picture vision on how you seek to solve scalability for blockchains. Sure. Uh, let me let me give a, a just just take a step back and 
and just look at the space more generally. Um, the, the analogy I've been using a lot for people is HTTP. HTTP 1.0 is a really, really stupid protocol. And people have heard me say this a million times, but I'm just going to keep saying it until someone hits me over the head with a 2x4. It's, it's so stupid that no computer scientist in their right mind would design this protocol. It took a physicist to design this protocol. Um, but its stupidity was its saving grace, because any network administrator could look at the protocol and say, oh, wow, this can't do very much. Um, and, uh, and as a result, they were willing to open a port in the firewall to let HTTP packets through. Um, and, and thus the World Wide Web was born. If it had been smarter and contained you know, session and, and other kinds of information, it probably wouldn't have gotten off the ground because nobody would let it through. Um, so likewise, um, proof of work and, and the, sort of the Bitcoin blockchain is a really stupid protocol. It won't scale. But it, it, it's, it will scale in the sense of adoption because it's really easy to explain. People understand it, and there's an existence proof. You can stand one of these things up, people can grasp what it does, and, and, and then you suddenly see, oh wow, there are all these consensus algorithms that we hadn't thought of before that are essentially economically secured consensus algorithms that favor availability over lockstep consistency. Um, and once you see that, then you can kind of go, oh, so there are a bunch of other ones that we could provide that are scalable. So let's start looking at that whole family of algorithms. Um, because it's really interesting if we have this economically secured leaderless consensus. And then, and then if you just take that as stipulated, okay, there's a bunch of them out there, we're going to find a few that, that suit our needs. What do you store? What, what do you come to agreement on? And, and again, the bit... The Bitcoin blockchain has a, has a relatively interesting answer. Let's store a ledger, right? Mayor has this many Bitcoin and Nash has this many Bitcoin, Sebastian has this many Bitcoin, right? So it's, and obviously, right, if we just look at the market today, that's a somewhat interesting application. Ethereum says, how about instead of storing a ledger, let's store the state of a virtual machine. And then we could make ledgers as programs on top of that virtual machine. So that's a, that's a great idea. That, that's a vast improvement on the original proposal. But, if, but, but now comes the rub, because which kind of computer you choose to store has a huge impact on how you scale. Um, and in particular, if you choose a computer which is sequential, one thing at a time, then you are going to be forced, at least for all the financial transactions executed against that computer, to give a global serial order, which will never scale. So, you need to be a little bit more circumspect and a little bit more careful about the kind of computer, or what I would call the model of computation, that you're going to store. And then you can kind of go through, you can list out all the models of computation. Um, and you can, and, and the, there's a, to, to make it easier to list them out, instead of listing them out willy-nilly in some kind of zoo-like taxonomy, there are four properties that you can use to analyze your models of computation. There's completeness. Everybody knows that now because we, we kind of know, uh, you know why, um, why Ethereum chose a, a Turing-complete language uh, for, for, as a part of the model of computation. There's also compositionality. Can I make... Um, make larger programs out of smaller ones. You know, I build build programs out of Tinker Toy sets, which are which are sort of um, programs themselves. It turns out that not every model of computation is compositional. There are two that stand out that are not. Turing machines are not compositional, and neither are Petri nets. Um, uh, now, interestingly, the dividing line between Turing machines and Petri nets is uh, concurrency, and that's the next next property. Uh, which, which started this whole rant of mine right now, which is, does your model in natively support concurrency? So, so let's just go through it again. Completeness, compositionality, concurrency, and then finally you need something that in the literature is called complexity. But really what's that's just, measure, can you measure in your computations the use of resources like space and time? Okay, so those are your four C's. If you then analyze all the proposed models of computation against those four C's, there's exactly one family that, that stands. And I discovered this 
in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. I, I listed out the four, the four characteristics. I saw that there was a gap, there was a hole, there was no model at the time that was proposed that had all four properties, and I predicted the existence of one. The next year, Robin Milner publishes his seminal paper on the pi calculus, and I evaluate it against my four Cs, and I discover, hey, here's a model, finally, that has all, all four properties. And then I started looking at that, that uh, model of computation and the whole family of, of, of models of computation that, that arises variants on that. I found a small little niggling bug in the pi calculus, which we fixed with something called the row calculus. And the row calculus is effectively the only model of computation that has all four Cs and also does something else which we know from computing is essential for industrial scale computation, and that is reflection. The reality is that people don't write programs. Programs write programs. And people write the programs that write those programs. Um, so if you look, all of the major mainstream languages have ultimately had to have some kind of notion of computational reflection to be able to get to industrial scale. Whether you're talking about C Sharp or Java or even uh, templates in C++, reflection is an important part of the model of computation. So when you add that feature in, there's exactly one model of computation that fits all those needs, and that's the row calculus. And that's part of the story. But what's interesting is how those features interact. When you start to notice how the features interact, you see that the model of computation is auto-sharded. So it's not like it just gives you concurrency. It gives you concurrency with this notion of sharding built in. We didn't bolt it on the side. We didn't add it later. It was a part of the notion of computation from the beginning. It was built in from the ground up. Likewise, security. Our notion of security isn't bolted on the side or developed post facto. It comes as a part of the model and lines up with the best proposals for security, i.e. the OCAPS models, that are a part of that. So when we talk about um, uh, scaling, there are other things that we need to talk about when we talk about scaling. It's not just the total number of transactions per second. Throughput, bandwidth, storage, these are all important parts of uh, uh, scaling. But it's not the only thing. In order to get that throughput, you have to have uh, concurrency and sharding and a bunch of other stuff. But you also have to have correctness. So here's a little thought experiment. What if Ethereum, back in 2016, ran at the, the uh, transaction rates that we expect out of the Visa network. So two or three orders of magnitude faster than they, than they uh, were running at the time. And then they deployed the DAO bug. Instead of $50 million being drained, all of it would have been drained in a heartbeat. So the point is that scaling also includes correctness. If you have garbage, if you make garbage run faster, that's not scaling. <laughs> so hopefully that gives, you, uh, that gives you a picture of what we mean by scaling and how we approach scaling. I'm sure Nash has a much better way of describing this than I did, and probably much more succinct too. So <laughs> let's hear from Nash. No, but that, that was actually really clear. I mean, for, for, an, for the non-engineer that I am, uh, I, I really like that explanation. I, I had to have que one question though. Is concurrency necessary for, for compositionality? Just maybe to come back on this idea of composi compositionality. So compos compositionality is this idea that I can build a program out of smaller little pieces, right? So I, I, I have functions, right? And I build uh, like a class out of these functions. Is, is that a, the, a good representation of what that is? That's, that's one way of doing composition. That's, okay. That's right. And, and, and so... So you're, you're absolutely right that there's, there's a relationship, and it's really easy to get that relationship screwed up. Um, and, and I'm so glad that you brought up object-oriented, because uh, object-oriented's uh, paradigm, um, I, I think initially people thought of the object-oriented paradigm and the notion of class and instance and inheritance and specialization as a good paradigm for also including the notion of composition that includes two autonomous computations running side by side, right? Like, like two cells in your body 
you know, like living side by side and potentially communicating by passing molecules back and forth, right? So it turns out, however, that there's a whole host of literature that shows that that doesn't work at all, which is why there are whole language proposals now that say, no, to get rid of the object-oriented notions of comp composition, eschew most of those, and move more towards these, these compositions that are organized around autonomous execution. The, the language Go is a, is, a, is a profound experiment along those lines. So, so yes, there are different notions of composition, but not every notion of composition. In particular, let's, um, the, the most famous one is the lambda calculus. The lambda calculus sits at the heart of F sharp, um, Scala, uh, Haskell, OCaml, Lisp, um, take your pick. All the functional languages, they, they arise out of this model of computation called the lambda calculus. If you go study the lambda calculus, you'll see there's a theorem called Berry's theorem, which proves to you <laughs> that the lambda calculus as a model of computation is sequential, one thing at a time. So if you had a blockchain-based solution that was organized around the lambda calculus or a functional language, it would be sequential. And you'd know that without having to do any other kind of investigation. Then you'd immediately go, that's an interesting idea, but you're limiting your scope and your scale. So composition okay. doesn't necessarily mean um, concurrency. Well, an, an interesting thing to note is that in the Google style guide for C++, you're not allowed to use inheritance or polymorphism, which are the composition uh, primitives that Greg is basically talking about at the object-oriented level. Rather than do that, what Google does inside its architecture is it uses remote procedure calls to have two independent services interoperate over the network by sending messages, which is effectively the design that's built into Rolang at the syntactic level. We just decided that rather than make it a, a toolkit with a bunch of libraries and a whole bunch of boilerplate code that you had to write, we would design it right into the syntax of the language from the get-go. And I do have another question uh, regarding, so you mentioned sharding, and you said that sharding was made possible as an inherent property of concurrency. And so if I understand correctly, then the idea is that by having concurrency, by having processes that may run in in parallel, whether or not they have to be synchronous with each other, you introduce sharding because you have these computations that can occur in separate spaces. Yeah, that's very close. There's, okay. a, li there's a little bit of nuance, a little bit of uh, subtlety. You, you could have concurrency that didn't have sharding built in, but the way concurrency is manifest in this particular model, which is that you have processes that are communicating with each other by passing messages over channels. It's the fact that the channels, um, uh, ha the, the space of channels, it can be structured. So if you think, if, if, if for a moment we, we imagine that URLs are kind of channels, right? It's a channel between someone who's seeking a resource and the resource, right? Um, so so I, use this, I use this URL as a, as a way of addressing the resource. And because that address has structure to it, I can talk about, you know, you know, all the addresses that have ABC as a prefix, right? So that's a space of addresses. And that space of addresses is, and, and the, the, the sort of built-in structure of that in the row calculus is what gives you the auto sharding. So it's, again, it's how the features fit together rather than, um, rather than uh, uh, just the fact that it's concurrent. If you look at um, uh, the sort of solutions for sharding data sets, that we've actually built that are successful uh, so far, they all sort of revolve around the central problem of finding the thing that you're looking for. Right? You, you've got, you've taken this one big haystack and you've turned it into a dozen smaller haystacks. Now, which haystack do you search, right? If you have to search them all, you've made no improvement. And so the, the structure of names is what allows the, 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 the blockchain to find the data that it wants to find quickly uh, without having to search through all the haystacks. Okay. Uh, there, there's, there's one notion I think that maybe it, it would help to, to clear up here, and that's the notion of concurrency in programming and, and, and how that relates to, to parallelism. And the way that I understand it, and you can tell me if I'm right here, so like concurrency is, say for instance, 
you know, you wake up in the morning and you're going to like brush your teeth and then you're going to go make your bed. And then like, while that's happening, you're making coffee and like you're, you're doing all these different things and they, they can happen in order. And, and sometimes they may overlap, but like ultimately you, you can't as, you know, it, in theory, like you can't as one person be doing two separate things at a time. You have to go back and forth. Now, parallelism is like, I'm brushing my teeth while I'm putting my shoes on and I'm doing two things at once. Is that a good way to look at it? These these are great questions, and it's, it's this, awesome. This is just me not understanding anything about this stuff. No, no, I, 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 level, I just, I just love it. it. No, but yes. these, these kinds of these kinds of uh, you know um, uh, uh, everyday examples are really really good. I often I often do um, um, everyday examples from traffic, right? So if you imagine an eight lane freeway, imagine an eight lane freeway in which n there was no lane crossing allowed. Okay. So you can get you can get eight streams of cars. So you can get eight times as much throughput on that on that section of freeway, right? Um, that's parallelism, and parallelism means they're not allowed to cross lanes. Um, concurrency means that they can cross lanes, which means they have to synchronize, right? One car just like can't smash into another without causing all kinds of havoc and really reducing the throughput on that section of of highway, right? When they cross lanes. You know, there, there's, there's some message passing, like you turn on your blinkers, there's a signal, I'm moving to the right, right? And then, and then there's a response in the, in the, 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 the lane over, which, will, which, you know, either there was a natural space or a space was opened up as a response to that signal, which allows the car to change. That's concurrency, right? And, and then we make a further dis distinction, typically, between concurrency and distributed, which has to do with uh, failure modes. Right, so in concurrency, typically you're thinking about even though they're running at the same time and synchronizing, um, they kind of all fail together. Whereas in distributed, they don't necessarily have to all fail together. So those are those are three sort of terms of art, and those are some rough rough guidelines for how to how to distinguish them. I want to take issue though that, that a person can't do the same two things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> a piano player is a really good example. <laughs> Um, and you can get six-year-olds who can play the left hand of a of a sh some sheet music and the right hand, and then put them together, right? So we. we yeah, do I mean that's things. sort of a basic example. I'm learning the piano now, and I'm figuring out that no, you can't do two things at once. Or well, I'm learning that you can, in fact, do two things at once. <laughs> yeah. So to put it back in terms of your original analogy, uh, parallelism is well is where you make coffee while you're brushing your teeth, and concurrency is where you don't care whether you wake up before you brush your teeth. <laughs> So is there like some kind of analogy you have for this model of computation? Yeah, I mean, ba basically you, you could think of it, um, you could think of it like molecular computation, right? So, so um, processes are molecules, um, and then the molecules synchronize uh, with each other um, by, um, by sharing things, or, or for example, they could share, uh, they could share electrons that would, that would enable them to synchronize, and those um, and, and when they share electrons, that, that creates a larger structure. Another, you can, you can go up a level in scale. So, so processes are not molecules, but they're, they're cells. And then they synchronize and communicate by sending molecules. Uh, they share molecules with each other. And it turns out that you can take this model up arbitrarily in scale. So processes are human agents. And they, they synchronize with each other by sending messages to each other over a variety of channels. So they might use, for example, um, cell phones and, and uh, telephone numbers as a way to send messages. So then, or YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so the nice thing about it is that it's, it's fairly abstract. Um, and, and in fact, if you, look at, if you look at the theory, the theory is, is, um, is parameterized in the notion of what you say a, um, a channel is. So essentially, the, the, there are two basic forms of processes. One is you have a, bro a process that's blocked waiting on input at a channel, and then after it gets that input, it's going to go and do some other stuff, which processes do. Uh, and then the other form is that a process is asynchronously sending some output on a channel. Those are the two basic forms. And then the others have to do with composition, right? So we can put two processes together to run in parallel, um, and 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 there, in order to get the whole thing off the ground, you have to have some kind of you know core building block processes. So you could start in the in the most primitive version. The core building block is just a stopped process. It does nothing. It's completely inert, 
right? So you know, you could you could talk about um, building off of that. You could say, well, I'm waiting for a phone call on my home number, and then I stopped. Or um, a more complicated process is I'm waiting for a phone call on my home number, and when I receive that phone call, it's going to give me another phone number. And then I'm going to take that phone number and I'm going to send it out on Nash's number. So there, that's, a, that, that's an example of a, of a process that we just built using our primitives. So in, in some senses, like in this model of compute, computation, there are these processes. Each process is essentially Turing complete. Like it can, it can take data, it can do all of the operations that a, that a Turing complete machine can do and then it produces an output. But in this model of computation, there's like not a single process, but there are like multiple processes and they communicate with each other. And using this model of computation essentially allows the programmer, the programmer has one big task to, to program the task in a way that it's distributed to these different processes. They will run some part of it themselves. When needed, they will interact with each other and and distribute it like they will complete the whole, the complete task. Yeah, that, that's not that's not a bad mental picture. I'm just going to throw in some brain candy for you <laughs> um, and, and for your audience. So you kind of bootstrapped that description by, by assuming uh, another model of computation, which was the, you know, the Turing model. You sort of, what, what you're imagining is a bunch of Turing machines that are all coordinating with each other by passing messages. It turns out that message passing is all you need. You don't need to assume any Turing complete stuff. You can actually code up arithmetic just as message passing. And that, 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 that ends up being a big, it's a, it's a twist in people's brains, usually when they encounter this. If that was candy, then I don't want to know what something is. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe liquor is quicker, I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but yeah, I sort of, the, 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 the main, the main thing that's really interesting is that all computational phenomena arise as interaction. And this was, this was Robin Milner's, uh, key insight when he found the Pi calculus, is that all computational phenomena arises as interaction. Super interesting. So basically it's the exchanging of messages that is the computation. That's it. The, the. The process itself is not computing anything, but the pattern of how that process exchanges messages with the other processes is how it computes. And this is exactly how your computer actually works, right? It, it consider just, you know, adding two numbers inside of the Intel CPU. Right? What's the last thing that the that the adder has to do? Right? It stores the results in a register, which requires the results to be moved from one part of the CPU to another part of the CPU. Right? When, you've, when you're when you done with the register and you want to store the results more permanently, you have to move it out to main RAM or to disk or, or onto the internet, right? And so the, the thing about von Neumann machines or Turing machines is that they sort of just ignored all of that because they viewed it as physical complexity that they weren't interested in reasoning about. But it turns out that if you start there, you get a more powerful model than Turing on von Neumann could, you know, knew, knew how to work with. And that model allows you to work with great networks of interconnected machines. It's, Ethereum is essentially like the EVM is trying to be a Turing machine, right? So there's like sets of instructions. Technically, it's a von Neumann machine, right? The EVM is a von Neumann machine. It is representing like uh, what the machine needs to do as these opcodes, right? And, um, and then you give it an input and it's going to use these opcodes to process and get the output. But central to how the EVM operates is that these opcodes will be executed one by one sequentially. So, so it gets the input, it might use the add opcode, then it might use the jump opcode, then it might use some other opcode. It does one of these operations one by one, then the output is, is produced and then this output can be given away to the next Thing. So like if I created a trans transaction in which I ping a smart contract, uh, the EVM executes that and then it might create a transaction and ping another smart contract. So there is, there is this sequential nature that is inbuilt to the EVM. 
And what you are essentially saying is if you change the model of computation itself in a way in which there are different processes and all of them can execute in is parallel or concurrent the right concurrently and in a model where the exchanging of messages is somehow implementing the computation itself then obviously you will have and each of these processes becomes a smart contract then you will have a natural substrate so you have one smart contract that you distributed into like 100 processes each of these processes can happen in parallel they can exchange messages and uh, and then they can compute and so because because these happen in parallel they can happen on different blockchains essentially well they, they don't necessarily have to happen on different blockchains but they can um, like let, let's say that that some of those communications don't really impinge upon others of the other of those communications then then you don't have to have the state of the one um, uh, visible in scope for, um, to carry out the computation for the other, and that's what's really important, right? So, I mean, this is this is this is all this is all more or less common sense. When I buy my coffee from the Wildwood Market down the hill, right, that transaction is almost certainly isolated from someone buying grilled tofu from a street vendor in Shanghai. Right, that's how our financial system scales right now. Right, so we gotta, we, we all, all we have to do is just model that, <laughs> and and we're gonna be much much faster. If if I have to sequentialize or serialize the order of the 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 the, the street vendor transaction in Shanghai with my coffee here in Seattle, that isn't gonna fly. Right, so we have to we have to, and and the important way to understand when to sequentialize or when you have to serialize is when they touch on the same state or they touch on overlapping state. And so if your model of computation allows you to determine when they're touching on the same state, then you can, you can figure that out and you can say, oh, these transactions have to be ordered. Now to, to bring it home, if you, if you look at the, the, uh, the opcodes of EVM, at the core of the row calculus, there's exactly one opcode. This output and this input match together, so reduce them and ship the data from the output into the awaiting continuation of the thing that's blocked on the input. There's one opcode. <laughs> now, it turns out, it turns out that in order to, after you've figured out that you can model arithmetic this way, and you can model string manipulation this way, do you want to do that? Well, maybe not. <laughs> it depends on what your goals are. But if you want to build a fast, scalable blockchain, maybe you can go ahead and already use primitives for arithmetic and primitives for string manipulation and so on and so forth, and then you decompose the problem of correctness, right? So you're the, if you have an uh, arithmetic library that you've already proven correct because, I don't know, some very, very smart people at, at Intel have spent over a decade doing that, then you don't have to do that again, right? Uh, and you just focus on the, the correctness of how you're assembling the uh, arithmetic computations, right? So, so again, the importance of what we were calling compositionality earlier and how it related to concurrency is not just that it allows you to scale in terms of throughput, but it also allows you to scale in terms of how you approach proving or securing your computation. So this compositionality corresponds to modularity. And the modularity is what we have to have in order to make the correctness problem be tractable at all. <laughs> um, so, 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 so again, what I'm trying to say is that these pieces fit together, and not just this way, but also this way. There, there's many layers to this um, that, that are all stacked in a very particular way. So that many problems, which in the past had been intractable, suddenly become tractable. So consider this example. There's one of these football tournaments that are ongoing, right? And these football tournaments are, has, has this sort of structure that there are 16 teams, right? Manchester United, Arsenal, whatever. And there's games of two. So Manchester United versus Arsenal. And there's another game of two, another game of two. 
eight will be selected to go to the next round and there'll be games there then four then two and finally one one will emerge the winner there's there's a tournament like this right and essentially uh i want to bet with sebastian like the four of us want to bet on the outcome of matches with each other and we want to represent these bets as smart contracts and we are going to ultimately make these smart contracts interact with each other and then we are going to uh, figure out how our chain would handle these interactions right so let's let's think of the simplest thing the simplest thing is me betting with sebastian right so me betting with sebastian on the first game which is manchester united versus arsenal right so he wants to bet on man u i want to bet on Ars- arsenal and let's say we are betting on the r r token the r chain token betting against so, me on football is not only simple it's a sure win well <laughs> 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 uh, one one of the things i was wondering is like in, in your setup you're forcing everyone to to bet like like c- c- could it be that um both nash and you bet on arsenal yes it could be okay i would never bet on arsenal though <laughs> 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 I was waiting for that one. <laughs> it was a perfect setup. Yes. <laughs> so, like, 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 let, let's first understand what a simple smart contract is. Like, so, so the human interaction I want with Sebastian is he has five R tokens. I have five R tokens. I put these five R tokens in some process slash smart contract. He puts the same. Some data comes. Oh, five days later, man, you won. and like the 10 go to either sebastian or to me depending on who bet correctly a simpler example of this like the the sports books are actually fairly um the intuition is a little bit less crisp maybe than um if you're playing poker in a casino right because when you start out the first thing that you do when you go to a casino to play poker is that you you know you get on a list and then you have to wait for a seat to free up so then the casino comes to you and tells you there's a free seat they sit you down and then what you do is you exchange money with the dealer that's at that table you don't exchange money with the you know with the with the pit boss you do it with the dealer who's right there at the local table he takes your money he turns it into chips and then all of your transactions are with the guy that's right in front of you the, the pit boss occasionally will come by to check what's going on but only just to verify that everything is all right in general he's not interested in what bet you're making on which hand right and so if i'm implementing a poker application as a smart contract all of what i want to do is i want to model the communications between you and the dealer the deck of cards and the other players at the table i don't need to model the casino as a process that interacts with you other than when you walk in and when you're ready to leave right and so we write the programs so that that they actually fit the physical model that you're looking at yeah totally Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, for a sports book it's a little bit more complicated because you can you know, you have the sports the bookie is basically running a clearing house. And clearing houses are slightly more complicated than poker games uh because you can take partial bets and somebody can lay down a bet and then the house will actually clear it instead of another counterparty coming along and that sort of thing. Uh all of that can also be modeled very easily with the row calculus, but it just takes probably more work than is worth it in a podcast. Yeah, yeah. But I think what I was going to do is just to go at just this idea of of sending an asset or a resource um to a contract which is held and then and then testing uh for a particular condition um and and once a particular condition is met then releasing um the combination of those resources out to one of the one of the parties. Right? So so in that particular case you you you're going to have a channel that represents um uh the res- the resources that you've received or the assets you've received from one of the parties a channel that you uh, receive the other um you're going it looks like um at least for the purposes of this discussion we can assume that there's a way to combine those assets right so you can add them together like like right now you can't add an ether to a bitcoin you could con- you could convert one to the other and add those or you convert them to some other thing and add that but you can't currently add an ether to a bitcoin straight up. Um uh, so so we have some assumption in 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 your description that you we can add these assets somehow. Um 
And so, so, so then you will also have a channel where you can probe the condition of your test. Okay, so, so, you, so the, the smart contract is, is waiting um, for both of the assets, and you can do that in parallel. So we have this notion of a join. So it's waiting on the channel where we're going to receive asset from, from player one and on a channel where we receive assets from player two. Once we've received those, then we can, um, in a variety of ways, we can either wait for a signal from the test condition or, ugh, yucky, we could pull um, on the channel for the test condition. And I, I, either of those are implementable in the row calculus, but let's say just, you know, for, for the sake of simplicity and cleanliness, we wait um, now for a, a signal from the, from the test condition channel. And once we have the test condition channel, we match that against the outcome. Either it was um, outcome uh, player one, one, or outcome player two, one. And uh, um, in either case, what we do is we send to a return channel. Let, let's say, again, for simplicity, that the return channel is, uh, is exactly the same as the channel of the, of the winning player. So we send out to that channel the sum of the two assets. Very straightforward contract. Um, it's, it's straight line in the sense of its structure, but it's already got parallelism in it. Why? Because there's, uh, there's waiting. The, the waiting part is happening. We don't care the order in which we receive the two assets. Does that make sense? It makes sense. So basically, like this is a process with two channels, one, one between my account and this process, and one between Sebastian's account and this process. And it's a matter of sending these assets over the channel. The process waits, gets the results, and sends the sends the assets back on one of the channels. That's correct. Now, now what happens if I want to do this? Now I want a contract in which we have this channel. So this represents our our bet, right? And then I want to say that only if I win this bet, then automatically make a bet with Greg on the outcome of the next match that this winning team is going to play. So I'm going to say I'm betting on Manchester United and I send the money. Only if I win this money, then automatically make a bet with Greg that in the next game versus Barcelona, Manu is also going to win. Yeah, yeah. So the modification of the, the one we just did is straightforward, right? So you'll have to have uh, one more channel, which is the channel for the next bet. You want to subdivide this into your um, uh, your contract and and the betting contract, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So so in that case, you're going to modify your con the contract that represents you. So the contract that represents you initially was very simple: send these assets to that uh, to that channel, right? Um, but now you're going to run that send these assets to that channel in parallel. That with something that's waiting on the outcome, right? So in the in, and when you wait on the outcome, then you you uh, you wait on 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 your the channel that you sent on. Now you wait, right? Now in in this case, to avoid confusion, it's now much better to separate those two, so that the channel that you sent out on is not the one you waited on, because you could potentially get this point of confusion where you receive the thing that you sent. <laughs> so it's a lot easier to. To, um, to, to separate those out. There's a send channel to the betting contract and a receive channel from the betting contract. So on the channel that comes back from the betting contract, you test, test the result. Is it zero? <laughs> I lost the bet. I didn't get any assets. Or is it greater than zero? I won the bet. I got some assets, right? And then the next thing I do is I make a bet with, uh, uh, with, with the, the, the next player, right? Which means I now send... Um, to, uh, to a, an instance of that other contract that, that has the two players bound to you and Greg. So if, if these two essentially bets are running on different blockchains... Uh, again, they don't have to be running... And I, I, want, I want to make this clear, and in fact, this is a point I wanted to touch on earlier. Um, they don't have to run on different blockchains. The different blockchains is, is um, orthogonal to, to what we're talking about. So... so like what the question I was really expecting that, that is related to ties this up with consensus is so it, let's say we have different instances of these parallel processes running on different nodes, 
right? And, and you know, uh, and, and the first time you get a race condition, right, where you've got two outputs and one input, or two outputs racing towards a blocked process waiting on a channel, right? But you're running that very same computation on nodes scattered all over the internet. How does that thing ever come to agreement, right? Like if, if the winner of this race is different than the, than the winner of the same race on a different node, then you can get double spin, right? That's, that's the interesting question. And, and, and it turns out that we have an interesting answer. <laughs> the, the consensus algorithm is guaranteeing that all the nodes agree on the winners of the races. And that's all it ever worries about. It doesn't, it doesn't worry about anything else. So our notion of transaction is very, very crisp. So what, what you're essentially saying is there can be lots of people that are, that are betting. And in order to resolve all of this thing, you need just this sliver of information, which is like who won which match. And this sliver of information is what we have to arrive at consensus. And once, once there's consensus on this information, everything else can resolve. Yes. The, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> and what our chain allows is, is, for, is for, for us some intelligent way to figure out what that minimal sliver of information is and just get to consensus on that sliver of information and leave everything else uh, behind to be processed offline by the nodes. Yes, that's, that's uh, again, there's, a, there's nuances there, but essentially, yes, essentially that's correct. And now notice that if you have a betting pool over here on, um, I, I don't know, um, the World Cup, and you have a betting pool over here on American football, right? The American football bets don't have to page in all the blockchain state that's associated with the World Cup unless there's someone who has conditional bets that, you know, like I'm betting on the winner of this American football game depending upon the result of this World Cup game. But if I don't have any bets that cross these two betting pools, then the state can be isolated. And because the state is isolated, this group of contracts doesn't have to download the blockchain state for this, and vice versa. So we're still in one chain, but these computations can be run without any of the overhead of knowing about this state over here or that state over there. Does that make sense? I mean, that, that makes sense for scaling. Uh, I, I, that example you gave earlier about you know, the, the two transactions happening in two different places, not having to know each other is, is, pro is probably like the best visual representation of scaling that I've ever heard. So thank you um, for clearing that up. <laughs> so I'd like to come back to like a more practical question as a, a one of the great things about, about Ethereum um, is, is how, Sort of easy that community has made it to write smart contracts, and there's a there's a there's a there's a massive community and people building applications on on Ethereum. Um, and you know, we were at we were at DevCon a few months ago, and we saw well, one of the things I saw, which was interesting, was sort of the the, the stack starting to come together and development tools and things like that, right? Beca making making it easier to, to for for just about anyone with like a limited amount of programming knowledge. To write a smart contract application, and that has sort of been one of the strengths of, of Ethereum is, you know, and one of the selling points in the beginning is like write a smart contract as easily as you would some kind of JavaScript uh, uh, code. Uh, I, I I presume that there's a very different um, standpoint, like with our approach with uh, with our chain and Rolang. Um, because these, la these languages are perhaps uh, not as easy to uh, to learn and to to manipulate. Can can you, uh, from a practical perspective, as like a developer or someone who's building applications on this, how different is it to write a DAP, say something like the DAO on 
our chain than it would be on Ethereum. Ethereum makes it easy to write incorrect programs, right? But it makes it very hard to write correct ones. And, and that's actually what we saw. Um, we've seen it now several times, right? With the, the DAO, with the Parity Wallet. Uh, there's, you know, undoubtedly dozens or hundreds of contracts that are deployed to Ethereum that have significant bugs that just haven't been exploited yet. Uh, but, but it's deceptive, right? The simplicity of Solidity is, is deceptive in much the same way that the simplicity of JavaScript is deceptive. You, yeah, you can stand something up and it will sort of work. But it's going to have a lot of bugs because you don't really understand what you're doing. The model of computation is too confusing. And the thing about Rolang is that the entire language fits on an index card. Right? So you can show somebody the entirety of Rolang in about 15 minutes. And it's, it, you know, syntactically, it's far simpler than Solidity or JavaScript or, or really any practical modern language. But it has all the power of those languages, uh, you know, at its fingertips. And so it's really easy and because it's compositional it's really easy to begin with something that you can understand completely and thoroughly and then build on top of that by making you know, building components that interact in ways that you have solid intuitions about right this is very difficult if not impossible in you know in modern programming languages uh, that don't have the benefit of the row calculus and so we we think that we're going to be able to teach people you know the basics of, of of programming in the row calculus, you know, in in, an, in about an hour, and get them to the point where they can, you know, if they're experienced programmers, there will definitely be some some new stuff and some uh, habits to overcome. Uh, but you know, our past experience has been that even high school students can learn this stuff in an afternoon uh, and can become, you know, could get to the point where they can write programs that are, you know, on the complexity of sort of your standard ERC token contract. That's something that you could learn to do in a day. And, and we feel really strongly that the inherent simplicity of Rolang is going to make it really, really straightforward for people to, to learn, even though the model of computation is very different. That's very encouraging for me, uh, <laughs> what you just said there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I used to write you know, PHP or JavaScript or whatever, but I don't, I don't have any like formal training. But that's that's one of the things I thought that was, I always thought which was interesting with Ethereum is that anybody can you know go on some kind of like uh, Coursera or online training course and you know spend some time and, and learn how to code a smart contract if you have some ambition and maybe a little bit of programming experience um, just sort of wanting to address there what the what the, the, the gap is between ethereum and, and something like rolling um, but from what I from what I understand it's it's it's, it's the, the the language is much simpler, uh, but there are assumptions about how you write the code that are much different than on a language like Solidity. If you've written code in PHP or JavaScript, you've debugged problems that occurred because the model of computation that's actually implemented and what you think it implements are different, right? That's the feeling that you get when you're staring at a chunk of code and it looks like it does what you want. And somehow when you run it, the, the program doesn't do at all what you wanted and you can't understand why it's doing what it did, right? That's that's what you're feeling right then is is the gap between the syntax and the semantics of the language. I know right? that feeling. And yeah, right, we all do. We, I mean like, <laughs> geez, 20, last 25 years of my life can be characterized by like levels in that feeling. <laughs> um, so the thing about Rolang that's so amazing is that the semantics came first and Greg did a great job of boiling the semantics down to the smallest possible uh, uh, you know, set of rules. And then the syntax is built directly on top of those. There's a one-for-one -one correspondence so that your intuition about what the program syntax says and what it actually does is very, very clear. It's very hard to get confused about what your program's actually doing. And, and actually, I will, uh, first of all, that's really, really well articulated. Th thank you, Nash. That was amazing. Um, and, uh, and just just to amplify Nash's point, even if we're talking, you know, like a strongly typed language uh, that has been bashed on by industry and lots and lots of commercial code deployed on it, like Java, the r reality is that Java is a part of a family of languages where um, when you're staring at the code, not everything is in the code. 
not everything that results in the execution of that program is in the code. It's not in front of you. You also have to keep in your in your mind, you know, the stack and and the threads that are active and a whole bunch of other stuff that's not on the page, which means the programmer's mind is is burdened. There's this cognitive load that's not supported anywhere on the page. And there are there are families of languages. Um, the lambda, the uh, or models of computation. The lambda calculus was the first one of such, and then the the pi calculus and and, and languages like that were, were the second such, where um, the 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 structure function relationship between what you see and how it executes, everything is on the page, um, and so so that's another thing that actually makes it easier for programmers. When, when you're looking at Roland code, you don't have to keep something else modeled in your head. You can offload that down to the page. And just look at the page and reason about what's in front of you. So it's actually easier rather than harder. I think maybe we could have spent another hour <laughs> trying to unpack this. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, and perhaps we can have you again. I think we could probably have you again on at some point. Um, but before we before we wrap up here, uh, we just talked at the beginning of the show about how this project was a cooperative. Uh, what kind of what kind of help are you looking for? Are you are you looking are you, are you like hiring people? Are you looking for contributors? Like how can people con contribute to this project? There are a, a huge number of ways in which people can con contribute. Um, everything from uh, helping with development to um, standing up nodes, to helping us with the, the business development, to writing applications on top of, uh, of the platform, um, to uh, helping us with governance, to helping us with uh, analysis of various economic uh, models. Uh, I mean, it's just the, the, the surface area of the work to be done is enormous. Um, and, and, and I want to say that, that, you know, it's for me what ties this all together is that we're in this all hands on deck phase anyway um the re the reason i'm doing this is because the ex blockchain represents this fundamental shift in coordination technology for people right T to date people have had you know sort of two and now th and maybe th an emerging third class of coordination technologies there's financial Instruments. Financial instruments allow human beings to or organize themselves and coordinate um, uh, amongst each other. Government or governance allows people to coordinate amongst themselves, right, to take care of each other and the planet. Social media has emerged as a new class of, um, of uh, 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 coordination technology, and the blockchain is, is one of the, 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 the newest forms. Now, we need this new coordination technology because we are in an all hands on deck situation. When you have someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson standing up on CNN saying, we don't have the technology to move all our coastal cities inland by 20 miles in the next 20 years. We need to recognize that the situation is dire. <laughs> we have we have some of the biggest name scientists on the planet, like like moving from their well established careers into working on climate change because the problem is so dire. And we need a coordination technology that's going to help us move faster. So the the, the truth, the context in which Rolang and, and and Archain is happening is that we're in an all hands on deck situation. So I really want people to figure out what their strengths are and plug in in whatever way they can because we have to. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, and that's a, that's a really, good, really good point and a really good note to end on, I think. But uh, on that note, um, you, w w there, there is a, a governance forum that is happening soon. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. Yeah, so the, Archain, the first Archain Governance Forum is happening in Seattle, uh, February 15th through the 18th. Um, and it's open to any member of the cooperative. And it takes you all of five minutes and 20 bucks to become a member of the co-op, <laughs> just like REI. Um, so please consider coming uh, and adding your voice into how the cooperative is organized and run. Uh, and also be exposed to 
um, some other technologies for coordination that aren't just blockchain. Great. And I, I did want, want to mention, um, uh, we didn't talk about this during the show, but the, if, if people want to, if people want to uh, really get a, a, a good, solid understanding more, I guess more on the technical side, but your, your talk at DEF CON, I was watching it. I watched it twice earlier today and I thought it was really, really great. I didn't see it in, at DEF CON, but, um, and the reason why is because you, you, you take this concept of correct by construction, correct by construction computation and you, you sort of map it out in a visual way that makes it very, I mean, a lot easier to understand, at least for me, uh, as, uh, as I, I tend to understand things more visually. Um, so I would encourage anyone to look at that, uh, have a look at that talk. I'll, we'll put the link in the show description. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you guys for, for coming on the show. Uh, it was inter very interesting to, to learn more about, uh, about our chain and great to have you back on, Greg. Um, so we release episodes of Epicenter every Tuesday. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, or your favorite uh, podcast app um, on iOS or Android. You can also watch video versions of the show on YouTube. Uh, follow us on Twitter. And uh, we're, we're doing something new right now. Um, we are experimenting with a platform called Gitter, which uh, some of you may know and use. Um, so we're going to have a Gitter channel. There's not a whole lot of people in there right now. It's just mostly just like me and, 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 and Mayer and Brian. Uh, but um, we do want to sort of try to build a community there, uh, you know, get people talking. And there's a channel there for feedback. So if you have a feedback about the show, you can you can let us know there and you can reach out to us there. And so the uh, you, know, you can search for Epicenter on Gitter uh, or the simple way to get there is epicenter.tv slash Gitter. That's G-I-T-T-E-R. Um, if you want to support the show, there's lots of ways you can do that. One of those ways just by leaving us an iTunes review. We really appreciate those and it helps people find the show. Or you can leave us a tip and the tipping addresses will be in the show description. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.